Welcome to the David Copperfield Reading Project, going through Dickens's great novel according to the schedule of the original parts, not in 20 months, but in 20 weeks, which should equate to about an hour and a half or two hours reading each week, depending on how quickly and how carefully you read. I won't provide any plot summary or any overarching analysis, at least not until we've finished reading the novel, but instead I'll give you some historical and biographical background and take a look at the ads and illustrations that accompanied the original publication in parts. I'll also be making some detailed points about naming and each week I'll pick out one example of Dickens's masterly prose style. Oh, and watch out for two letters that will be popping up on the screen. They're clues that will help one of you to win this first edition of Bleak House. Throughout the first half of 1849, the major international news story was the ongoing revolution in Hungary. When Buda and Pest fell, the nationalist government moved to Debrecen, with Kossuth Lajos being appointed as head of state. And later in the year, it moved again to Seged, where I am right now. There were major victories and defeats on both sides, and the final outcome hung in the balance for several months. Dickens himself was well aware of these events and as a firm supporter of Hungary's efforts to break free from Austrian and Russian influence, gave generously to the Fund for Hungarian Relief. In other news, on May the 3rd, a levy on the Mississippi burst, flooding New Orleans. Sound familiar? And on May the 12th, the Astor Place riots took place in New York City, in which roughly 30 people died and 120 were injured. Unbelievably, but truly, the deadly riots outside a theatre arose from a dispute over the relative merits of two celebrated Shakespearean actors, an American named Edwin Forrest and an Englishman, Dickens's close friend William McCready, who was on tour in the New World. And just one more little point. In April 1849, the perennially useful safety pin was patented by the American Walter Hunt, selling his rights to the invention for just $400 to pay off a $15 debt to a firm that went on to make millions. At the start of the writing process for his new novel, Dickens was barely ahead of the deadline for submitting monthly parts to the printers. Part one was ready in early April, shortly after he decided on the title, but he struggled on the second part and only completed that around May the 5th, a few days after the first part was published. Dickens had an outline plan, but many plot details and characters only emerged during the course of composition. He was living at the time in Devonshire Terrace, London, and as well as working on Copperfield, wrote a series of articles for the examiner on the subject of the mistreatment of children and was actively involved in the affairs of Urania Cottage, the home for fallen women that he'd established with Baroness Coots. On May the 12th, he hosted a grand dinner party attended by, amongst others, Thackeray, Elizabeth Gaskell and Thomas Carlyle. Dickens must have been delighted when the great Carlyle referred to himself as a lone, lone creature, a characteristic lament of Mrs. Gummidge, who had only made her debut in print less than two weeks earlier. We know from the title of the novel that the hero, if indeed he is a hero, is called David Copperfield. However, I would argue that throughout the novel, the central character and his author, Dickens, are in search of a name. Another way of looking at the matter is to say that although David Copperfield is the I narrator's given name, it doesn't truly belong to him until all the possible variants have been explored. It doesn't truly belong to him until all its possibilities and variants have been explored. We learn in chapter one that he should never have been born a boy, but a girl, in which case his name, or rather her name, would have been Betsy Trotwood Copperfield. Thus we're informed, even before he manages to get delivered, and David is well aware of these facts in his infancy, that his birth and name, at least in Aunt Betsy's eyes, 
are grave mistakes which need to be rectified. Keep a look out for other names that are given to David throughout the novel and who bestows them on him. In the very first Copperfield advertiser preceding the text, there are 32 pages of ads, the first 23 of which are for other books or magazines issued by a range of publishers. At the time, the medium of print was the best way of communicating information or news about other printed items. And a Dickens novel in parts, with a guaranteed sale of at least 25,000 copies, was one of the best ways of targeting a wide reading public, which was, of course, the target demographic for novels in early Victorian Britain, where the majority of people were still illiterate. A couple of ads that caught my eye are on facing pages promoting works by the leading novelists of the day. On the right-hand page are announcements concerning the latest additions to the recently launched cheap editions of both Dickens and Bulwer-Lytton, published by Chapman and Hall. Opposite these, we can find an ad for Thackeray's 1848 masterpiece, Vanity Fair, and for his new novel, Pendennis, which is often compared to David Copperfield, and which was appearing concurrently with Dickens's novel in 20 monthly shilling parts, and was also issued by Bradbury and Evans with Thackeray's own illustrations. The first two plates by Fizz depict the small boy David in the Blunderston village church and the Peggotty clan in their boat house on the shore. For intending readers encountering these images before they even start on the text, the first plate would show them a scene that everyone could identify with. They would all have been in a church and the vast majority would be familiar with the wandering gazes of children who were bored with the liturgy. In the text, Dickens takes us inside the child mind and shows us the working of David's and his own youthful imagination. I look up at the monumental tablets on the wall and try to think of Mr. Bodger's late of this parish, and what the feelings of Mrs. Bodgers must have been when affliction saw long time Mr. Bodgers bore, and physicians were in vain. I wonder whether they called him Mr. Chillip, and he was in vain. And if so, how he likes to be reminded of it once a week. I look from Mr. Chillip in his Sunday neckcloth to the pulpit, and think what a good place it would be to play in, and what a castle it would make, with another boy coming up the stairs to attack it and having the velvet cushion with tassels thrown down on his head. In time, my eyes gradually shut up, and from seeming to hear the clergyman singing a drowsy song in the heat, I hear nothing, until I fall off the seat with a crash and am taken out, more dead than alive, by Peggotty. By contrast, the second plate immediately defamiliarises us, literally turning the world upside down and creating a home out of a disused fishing boat on the liminal space between land and sea. And who are all the various figures in the illustration? And how are they related to each other? There's nothing for it except to read the story to find out. Did you spot the competition clues? Every week I'll give you one letter from the anagram and then one letter from the cryptic clue, in that order. Good luck! But now to this week's close reading question. In the first three chapters, who drowned and who didn't drown? And why? Or why not? See you next time!